This lecture is about the National Security Agency's Bulk Domestic Phone Metadata Program, operated under the FISA Business Record Authority. This program is very similar to the NSA's Email Metadata Program, which was the subject of the last lecture. All of that internal procedure about three different databases and targeting criteria and hops is roughly the same. And the statutory and constitutional issues are also quite close. I'd like to highlight just three key differences between the email and phone metadata programs. The email program used FISA pen trap orders, that is, Section 214 of the USA Patriot Act. The phone program uses FISA business record orders, which are Section 215 of the Patriot Act. As I mentioned in the last part of the course, one reason the executive branch may have preferred business record authority is that it does not include statutory notice and suppression provisions. The next difference I'd like to emphasize is that in the email program, the NSA slurped up data as it flowed across domestic internet backbone networks. The agency made some embarrassing overcollection mistakes in the process. In the phone program, by contrast, the agency receives structured data from telecom services. While that hasn't totally prevented overcollection, it has mitigated the risk. Finally, the email program was transitioned to FISC oversight in 2004 and ultimately discontinued in 2011. The phone program was transitioned to the FISC in 2006, strangely without a thorough opinion, and at the time of recording in 2014, it remains ongoing. The precise scope of the program is uncertain, but it does seem to implicate a meaningful share of all phone metadata in the United States. The executive branch did announce some major changes to the program in 2014, and I'd like to briefly touch on those. One change was that the FISC would begin reviewing seed queries for reasonable, articulable suspicion of terrorism activity. Recall, it used to be that targeting decisions were made solely within the executive branch. Another revision limited access to two hops, down from the three that had previously been possible. Finally, the White House has withdrawn its support for the program in its bulk form. Instead, it believes telecoms should hold call records, and the NSA should be able to quickly query those records. I should note that the phone metadata program has had compliance issues of its own. They don't appear to have been quite of the severity as the problems with the email metadata program, but they also were certainly black marks with the FISC. One problem, once again, was automated querying of the raw data without a reasonable, articulable suspicion determination. Another problem was querying related phone numbers without the required determination. Once again, there was some internal dissemination of data without cluing in the FISC. And also, once again, the NSA was sharing information with other agencies without the minimization review required by court orders. Let me briefly touch on the value of this program. There is very thin evidence that this is an effective counterterrorism program. The intelligence community has repeatedly invoked several anecdotes in support, but they really haven't withstood scrutiny. In fact, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board undertook a thorough examination of the phone metadata anecdotes with access to classified information. It spotted just one intelligence success that could be uniquely traced to the phone metadata program. That's the prosecution of a San Diego taxi driver who lent material support to the Somali terrorist group Al-Shabaab. So, again, very thin evidence of success. The final point I'd like to make about this program is that there are a series of common factual assumptions about the privacy properties of phone metadata. They've been tossed around frequently in surveillance reform debates, especially by politicians. One assumption is that phone metadata is not identifiable. These are 
just phone numbers, not individual names. Another assumption is that phone metadata is not densely interconnected. That matters greatly because it determines how much metadata is within two or three hops and can therefore move into the corporate store. A third assumption is that phone metadata is not sensitive. What's the big deal, the argument goes? It's just call logs. Well, this happens to be one of my own areas of academic research with colleagues at Stanford, and our research suggests all three assumptions are quite inaccurate. Matching a phone number to a person's name or a business is really easy. And it turns out that phone metadata is densely interconnected. As for sensitivity, we've been able to spot medical conditions, firearm ownership, and more using solely phone metadata. So this common invocation that it's just metadata really is inconsistent with empirical results. So that's a quick sketch of how the NSA's phone metadata program is a lot like the discontinued email metadata program, how there's thin evidence of the program's efficacy, and the potential privacy impacts of the program. The next pair of lectures turn to controversial activities under Section 702 of the FISA Amendments Act, beginning with the PRISM program.